Well, hello there. Today is uh, Tuesday Devotions with Justin, and Kevin Burkett is behind the camera and running sound, so I want to thank him personally for all of his extra time, and we're doing this late Monday evening. That puts him in a crunch, and uh, things could not be uh, any different this week. So I want to thank Kevin uh, especially. This is our eighth devotion, and I've entitled it, P squared equals KP, and KP does not stand for kitchen patrol that often uh, uh, was used in the military. These thoughts that I'm going to share today are inspired by the memory of people I considered spiritual giants whom you've probably never heard of before. One was a woman named Helen Hester. She was a recorded Friends minister from 1927 until she retired the year I graduated in 1978. And I had the privilege of being her pastor uh, the last uh, seven years of her life. She always prayed that the gospel would reach every man, woman, and child. I'll never forget that phrase. That's, she prayed that every Tuesday when we prayed. Another couple of men that were uh, great prayer warriors were Dale Lawrence and John Plank, who's still living. And both of these men always thank, thanked God every prayer with thanking God for His tender watch care over us. The other was Lloyd McDonald, whose memorial service is this coming Sunday afternoon. And Lloyd was a wonderful pastor. He was a great friend and a spiritual mentor to me. He pastored for over 50 years uh, in various yearly meetings as far as from Ohio, North Carolina, Indiana, and Iowa, and even Arizona where he started a church. This is how he started every prayer when he prayed with me every Wednesday morning here in uh, Iowa. We thank you, Lord, for the power and privilege of prayer. This is how he religiously started each of his prayers. Power and privilege are the words that have lodged in my spirit from Lloyd's prayer life and his longing to seek the face of God and be a instrument of God's love and joy and peace in the world. Now one of the things about prayer that I just want to talk to, us, talk to you about and remind myself of is that prayer is not some kind of spiritual trick or method of arm twisting God about what we want. Prayer is a matter of giving ourselves wholly to a holy God and integrating the divine character into our distorted character and our twisted minds. Prayer is similar to having our car realigned so it travels straight and the tires don't wear out too quickly. You take your car in, they put it on an alignment rack, and using delicate equipment and instruments, they adjust the wheels so the car runs straight and true. And prayer is how we get aligned with God's character and God's methods. We pray in order that God's ways, which are above our ways, become our ways. Posturing our heart in submissive listening allows God and God's thoughts to transform our debased thinking. Listen carefully to this portion of Isaiah chapter 55, which begins with God offering us to come and purchase wine and milk, even though we are financially broke. We are destitute, and yet God offers to us this wine and milk. The chapter begins thus with grace, grace offered to us. And then the prophet announces, Seek the Lord while he may be found, Call on him while he is near. Let the, fors let the wicked forsake their ways, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let, a let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says God. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are, my, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is not a text about God having this will, and we can't figure it out. 
uh, which I've heard this text misused before. This is about a God who says that God's methods, God's character is above our depraved human character. And God is calling us to come to Him to forsake our old thinking and to take on God's thinking, God's ways and God's thoughts which are higher than ours. Isaiah's words unveil for us that our ways often fall dreadfully short of God's ways of grace and forgiveness and mercy. We often, I know I do, I miss the target of God's glory summed up in the word agape, unconditional love for other people. Prayer reminds us that divine ways are not tit for tat. God's ways are full of grace and truth and pardon. John records for us the teaching of Jesus who taught something very powerful but something we have to look at very carefully. Whoever believes in me, says Jesus, will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. John 14, 12 through 14. Wow, those are powerful words. Do anything in my name. Ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, when I was a young Christian starting out in my faith journey with Jesus, I read this text and similar ones erroneously, believing that if I asked Jesus, Jesus would grant my every request. My conception of God was like a gopher. Go for this God, go for that God, I need this. Probably the most profound experience of missing the mark in prayer was in the process of my 46-year-old mother dying from colon cancer. She died miserably. I implored God to heal and save my mother because I wanted to keep my mother. However, the cancer was too far advanced. It already metastasized through her body. And she died a horrific death in the mid-1980s. And when she died, and I was thinking about my prayers to God, these heartfelt feelings and these heartfelt prayers that I offered to the eternal mind, the creator of the universe, and my prayers were not answered, it sent me into this theological tailspin which took me three years to work through. Either God didn't care about my mother or myself, or God didn't have the power to heal. Or I wasn't good enough to be heard by God. For don't the scriptures in the book of James say the prayers of a righteous man accomplishes much? Now, I say these things because one of the things that Richard Foster says in his book on prayer, especially in the chapter Intercessory Prayer, is that we should always pray to God before we pray. We should always pray about our praying. That is wisdom. If I would think back on my mother's process of dying, I would have prayed very differently at age 60 than I would at age 25. At this age, at this time, I would have prayed things like this. Dear God, may my mother be filled with your forgiveness, your love, your compassion, your hope, and your comfort. And Lord, strengthen me to be a loving and tender son to her as she goes through this process of transitioning from this world to the next into your arms. That's a very different kind of prayer. As I've matured in Christ, I've realized that the Holy Spirit will grant anything we request as long as it is in the name of Jesus. Now, I want, to hold, I want you to hold on to your spiritual trousers 
Because I, there's no way I'm suggesting that God's chief task is to distribute anything you and I desire. Let's look at the text slowly. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Asking for anything in Jesus' name doesn't mean that we petition God for a Mercedes-Benz or a bigger house or a swimming pool, as was the asinine testimony of Joel Osteen's mother. Asking God, asking Christ, asking the Holy Spirit for something in Jesus' name means that you're asking in alignment of Jesus' very character, His very spirit. In the Jewish tradition, children were named as a reflection of their inner character, of their traits within them. So Samuel, for example, means God hears you. You recall the story of God speaking to Samuel three times. Or in the New Testament, Lazarus, in chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, his name means God helps. And Jesus spoke his name and asked him to come out of the tomb, commanded him to come out of the place of death. And Lazarus rises up and comes out of the tomb and his death clothes are unwrapped and he's restored to life, life in Christ. You can also remember with me Saul, who his mother prayed and prayed at the temple at Shiloh for a son. And his name means asked for, prayed for. Jesus, of course, is the Aramaic of the Hebrew name Joshua, Yeshua, which means, of course, Yahweh saves, God saves, God delivers. And now this brings us back to petitioning Jesus for anything in His name. Praying in Jesus' name means that we pray in the character, the spirit, or as the Apostle Paul says in a quite profound way, that we have the mind of Christ we pray in the character, spirit, and mind of Jesus. You know, the Jesus who came to heal, love, and forgive, as we sing in the ancient hymn. The Jesus who refused to manipulate people or roughshod over the poor. Who wouldn't even break a damaged reed or snuff out a flickering wick. A Jesus who fully embodied the fruit of the Spirit that's listed by Paul in the fifth chapter of Galatians. A Jesus who was filled with unconditional love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm pretty well assured that if we pray for those kinds of characteristics to enter into us and transform our hearts, those are the prayers that Jesus will do and answer for us. Because you see at a basic level, prayer isn't really about pleading with God about our stuff and sometimes even our circumstances in which we find ourselves. Prayer is about us listening and allowing God to reorder our priorities, our attitudes, our character, our passions. That we would become concerned about what the Father is concerned over. Remember the older son who stayed on the farm while the younger brother ran off and squandered his inheritance. The older son was miffed because he felt that the father favored the younger son who had blown it all. The older son's problem wasn't really about the waste or even that the father killed the fatted calf so they could host the entire community in a celebration of the son who was found. 
No, the older son's problem is that he did not understand or love what the father loved. His children. The story is a stark reminder that we may be in the father's house, we may be on the father's ranch, but we can be in our own distant country if we're not aligned with the father's vision and methods of transforming the world. Prayer then is intently listening for the father and then joining him and the Christ and the Holy Spirit in practical action as God's co-workers in and for the world. So prayer is in some ways very simple. First we listen. We listen to the scriptures. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We listen to ourselves. We listen to the broader faith community. We listen to church traditions that are life-giving. And then we go and do likewise. The final, the final words of Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Go and do likewise as the foreigner did. We go and do likewise, whether in word or deed, all in the name of the Lord Jesus. All in the character of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord. The methods of the Lord. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. A. M. Bound stated that the answer to prayer is the part that glorifies God. The answer to prayer is the part that glorifies God. I want to thank Helen Hester, Dale Lawrence, John Plank, and Lloyd McDonald for P squared the power and privilege of prayer equals kingdom productivity. Pray on, go on, and carry on as good soldiers of Christ Jesus. God is trustworthy. So be it. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength, with all I am, I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. God does nothing except by prayer wrote A.W. Tozer. God bless you all. Good day.